Um, so again, my name is Petrushka Basin Larson. I'm the program director at the Laundromat Project, and I am joined here today by Yvette Ramirez, and I'm the program associate here at the Laundromat Project. And I'm Allison Kibbe, and I was a fellow in um, 2014. This just the past cycle. Great. So. Um, the agenda for today's info session is um, we're going to actually go over this PowerPoint, um, which is on your screen. And it's basically um, all the information that can be found on our website in the guidelines page uh, or in the guidelines PDF. Um, but sometimes it's helpful if someone's saying it. Um, and then we're going to watch a quick video um, from one of last year's residents. Um, I'm going to actually have a quick Q&A with Allison just based on about her experience last year as a fellow. And then we will open the floor for questions um, from you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, type them in the questions dialog box as we're going through. And then at the end um, of those other parts that I mentioned that we'll address in the info session, we'll actually review and like all the questions and answer them um, in the order that they were received. So welcome. Um, this info session is really uh, an opportunity for us to share information about our fellowship and our residency programs. Um, under the Create Change umbrella. So the Laundromat Project is an arts organization that brings programming to laundromat spaces and other everyday spaces. Um, we do this by amplifying the creativity that already exists within communities um, to build community networks, solve problems, and our, enhance our sense of ownership in the places we live, work, and grow. Um, the Create Change program was developed to give artists resources to be catalysts um, for connection and change in their own neighborhoods around whatever topics they felt were important and relevant to their to their neighbors and themselves. Um, it initially started off as a residency program, um, and I will talk obviously more about what this program is. Um, and it soon evolved into include a fellowship program, which basically provided resources or provides resources to artists of all disciplines, backgrounds, um, and you know, like every capacity, uh, all backgrounds, um, to to have a space to gain more information and tools on how to work in community-based settings using art as a platform, no matter where you are working. And so um, it currently includes the residency, the um, fellowship, and then our commissions program. And the commissions program is not something that we're going to talk about today uh, because it's actually only available to alumni of our fellowship program. So that's one actually one benefit of participating in the fellowship program. Uh, but I will briefly say that the commissions program offers um, a, a couple of fellows who are selected through a, a selection process, the same amount of funding that we provide our residents um, and the freedom to do a project in a public setting. It doesn't actually have to be a laundromat. It can be any setting. Um, so yeah, we can you can spend time learning about last year's commissions projects um, on our website, but it, it is an opportunity for us as an organization to invest in our artists in the same way that they have invested in us through uh, participating in the fellowship. Um, but we will start with um, our residency program. So some benefits are that you know you receive five thousand dollars honorarium that's generally dispersed on a monthly basis as you know a thousand dollars over the course of the program, and then um, a fifteen hundred dollar production budget to produce um, your project. This uh, production budget is on a reimbursable basis, so um, you will generally receive like your first um, disbursement of money, and then. Maybe you'll start making purchases for your project and then you submit your receipts and then we reimburse you and that cycle continues through the um, life of the program. Um, the other another benefit uh, is the opportunity to develop or incubate a community based project that engages others in the development of the project. So, you know, if you've had an idea for a while and maybe you haven't had it like necessarily. Um, you didn't have it in mind for like a laundromat based setting, but it could be adapted to a laundromat setting, then this would be a really great opportunity for you. The, the program isn't just for artists that have an existing project. Um, it can be a new idea, definitely. But in the selection process, the panel will look at the applicant's ability to fulfill all of the um, details of the of the proposal, and so they will obviously also look at the history of the artist's um, work in working in similar sort of community based settings and in engaged capacities. Um, but it's a great opportunity to start a project. Actually, there are a 
a number of projects that were seeded through the residency program and that have gone on to have um, many wonderful lives globally um, and also um, in, a, in a national context. So it's a, it's a great opportunity um, for that. Let me click. Okay, so um, it's a another benefit of participating in the residency is the opportunity to have access to an incredible range of um, information uh, that's designed to deepen and expand one's socially engaged creative practice. So um, residents are not required to participate in all the workshops that we um, organize for fellows, but they are encouraged and they are welcome to. Um, in the past. Residents have attended all of the workshops, um, and in other cases, they've attended some of the workshops that they feel like are most relevant to sort of what they need to hone um, as as an artist. So, and we'll talk about the menu of workshops that we offer when we get to the fellowship portion of this presentation. Um, also, you know, a benefit of being a resident and a fellow, and just generally an artist working with the LP, is that. Um, we we I think we take pride in, in connecting folks to an access I mean, sorry to a rich network of local and national peers, um, activists, arts professionals, curators, funders, and change agents. Um, and of course, this includes all alumni from the Create Change program. Um, one feature where this is kind of activated is through uh, we have a listserv that's exclusively available to artists that have participated in the Create Change program, um, where we share a lot of information. And I was just on a call earlier today with an artist who is actually an educator um, with us, but who gets the same information because obviously we cross posts and they're just like, you all as an organization are really committed to artists and um, providing um, not just opportunities or making available, not just opportunities that you all are offering as an organization, but opportunities um, both locally, nationally, and even internationally. So um, it's just to say that by participating in this program or any, really any LP program, this is just another benefit. Um, formation of a strong and long-lasting peer network where one can share their creative vision strategies for change and ideas. Naturally, um, you know, in any program where you're spending a lot of time with people, this happens. But I, what I have loved sort of witnessing over the years is how uh, artists who've participated in different years of, let's say, this particular program have um, become part of one network and have used each other as resources. Um, for brainstorming and for collaboration. So um, that is just one other benefit. And of course, as an alumni, um, you're eligible to receive grants from the LP for future community-based projects. One thing that we hope to launch um, in the near future is a micro-funding opportunity for artists that um, are both working with us in an educator capacity and also through our residency fellowship and commission program. So again, that's something that would just be exclusive to LP artists. Um, and then, preference for ongoing professional opportunities such as speaking engagements and press coverage and commissions. So often we get emails from people across the country to come and present about the organization and about the experiences um, um, that our artists have had or that uh, constituents that are living in our neighborhoods have had. Uh, and so we will call on artists that have, you know, done really amazing work with us to speak on our behalf and share their experiences, share the projects that they've done. Um, and that happens, you know, throughout the year and not just specifically throughout the Create Change program. So um, who should apply to the residency? Artists that are not just interested in art for art's sake, but those who intend for their creative practice to bring about social justice, cultural equity, cooperation, or cultural preservation. Um, so just, I think this is like one of the most important things, obviously social, Socially engaged art and social practice are really hot button terms um, that can be very meaningless. Um, and this is basically what we mean by those terms. Um, this is not a, a program that uh, is for artists that are just kind of thinking about how their ideas are relevant to other people that they live around through acts of generosity. It's really about social justice, cultural equity, cooperation, and cultural preservation. Um, other, um, or rather something else to consider when applying to this program to figure out if you're an ideal candidate um, is, are you already creating positive local impact um, with a demonstrated socially engaged artistic practice? So I kind of, I will unpack this a little bit because I will say that in the past, all artists have not had like a large portfolio of doing socially engaged artistic practice, but their politics, 
just as a, as a person, as an artist, were in that direction. Um, and sometimes working with us might have been their first opportunity to really explore what their practice looks like in this realm. Um, so I encourage you to not feel intimidated by the application process if you feel like you don't have 10 projects under your belt. Um, let's see. So ideal candidates should also um, want to develop their individual creative practices by incorporating tools of social engagement within it. Um, want to build a community among, amongst artists working to create impact within their creative practice. Uh, believe that listening first and doing second is the best strategy for developing community-based art projects. This is another one that I feel like um, deserves some careful thought and attention. Often uh, with just talking about community-engaged work and social engaged work and uh, yeah, like people kind of enter that space with their ideas as um, the guide and really it's not about your ideas. Um, it's about your creative capacity to amplify existing ideas within the space that you're working in. And so in order to do that, you have to listen first and then kind of figure things out after that. So um, if you are in agreement, then apply to this program. Um, so then also uh, you should live in bed Harlem or Hunts Point slash Longwood, which are neighborhoods that are very close together um, in the South Bronx. Um, if you're thinking about this program, if you live outside of those neighborhoods, then this is probably not the this is not the best program for you because as an organization, those are our geographic focuses. So, think consider our fellowship program uh, perhaps. So these are just some images from past projects. Um, you know, historically, this program actually used to be available to artists in a citywide capacity, um, and in 2000 and 13, we shifted to focus just on the uh, three, well, four-ish neighborhoods that I um, just mentioned. So a lot of the projects, obviously, they all happen in laundromats, but they don't just have to happen in laundromats. And um, I think outside of our commissions program, I have yet to see any residency projects that have included um, uh, venues that are in addition to the laundromat. Actually, I've stopped on this image, um, which is a flyer from a project that happened a couple of years ago. Um, and the artist, uh, Shawnee Peters, organized a microfilm festival in her, um, or in a, in a Harlem laundromat not far from our office. And she, the culmination of this project was um, the screening of the five top videos, or film, or video works rather, that, um, that laundromat patrons voted on throughout the, the course of the residency. And they were screened at the Schomburg uh, during this red carpet uh, finale screening where everybody is a star. And, and so this is maybe, this is an example of another venue being included within the project. But um, generally speaking, artists have not simultaneously engaged laundromats and other venues. But I'm saying this, I'm bringing this up because it is definitely something that can be done. Um, and you should feel empowered to do. So to participate in the residency program, artists should identify as a person of color. They should have a demonstrated creative practice and already be making social engaged art. Um, they should have a demonstrated, they have, sorry, they should have demonstrated their ability to connect their artistic practice to local community topics by having already completed at least one community-based project. Live in one of the LP's anchor neighborhoods, uh, be at least 21 years of age, and not be currently enrolled in a degree bearing program. And of course, of course, be able to commit the time and attention to developing and presenting um, their laundromat based project by participating in all of the programmatic activities that are outlined in our guidelines PDF on our website. Um, and we, you know, just based on la uh, not, not just last year, a couple, the past couple of years, we've been kind of polling residents to see like how much time they're spending. And it really is a range, but at minimum, um, you should expect to um, spend at least 300 hours working on your project over six months. And so the best way to kind of get a sense of what that looks like is to kind of just use your calendar and see what your open dates are and say, okay, I can spend five hours here and kind of divide that amongst uh, the, the six month span of the program. Um, because 300 hours, seems like a little, but it kind of is a lot and it might seem like a lot. It might not be as much to other people, but I really encourage you to use your calendar um, as a tool to figure out like what that actually looks like for your life. Um, so strong create, create change residents have demonstrated a record of artistic excellence in their work samples and resume. So um, work samples, some of these, sorry, some of these points are going to be the exact same for the fellow 
um, portion of this presentation. So I will kind of zip through them when we get to that part. But one thing I will say is that you should never ever in any application, this one and others, leave your work samples for the la to the last thing. You know, spend time picking out work samples that are going to tell your story, like who you are as an artist, um, and are going to present your work in the best light. You know, spending time to have your work documented as your work is happening, not like in preparation for this deadline, because there's really not that much time left uh, in the application um, timeline, but really be thoughtful about the work that you are, the, rather the samples that you're submitting to represent your work, because that is what the panel um, is using to understand who you are as an artist. And this pro this program um, is open to not just visual artists. So just make sure that your work is just, is documented very well, because often as, as a panelist, like, people will go to the art, uh, the work samples first and then read the answers. And so it, it's just really important. And I just can't stress that enough. So spend time, don't make it a last thought. Um, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I, it would be like, you know, it would be remiss not saying it. Um, familiarity or interest in local issues impacting um, their neighborhoods. And, and I should say, let me contextualize issues. We really don't come to this work from a um, issue or um, a lack mentality. So issues could be, it really should be topics. Um, what's happening in your neighborhood? What are the things that you want to explore? What are the things that are relevant to you and your neighbors? Um, and it should, applicants that are interested in this opportunity should have familiarity with what is happening um, in their neighborhood. And have a willingness to take risks and step out of the comfort zone. Okay, laundromats are, are as a site for our presentation and, and exploration and facilitation is, is you know, it doesn't happen every day. So um, obviously there are a lot of risks that you take with just putting yourself out in, in this kind of space um, that is not already interpreted for art um, sort of presentation, but um, you should really feel open and energized by that sort of uncharted territory and be comfortable to be flexible um, around what might shift as a result of being there. Um, interest and ability to actively engage non-artists in all aspects of your creative practice. So that's actually like an image on the right of Suran Song, who was a resident with us several years ago. And she um, has a yoga practice and also um, a printmaking practice. And she, part of her project, it, her project started in one way. And then when it wasn't going in the direction that she um, had anticipated, she started offering yoga classes at her laundromat. And so this was actually like a really amazing service and, 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 and aspect of her project that people got really excited about. And, um, and it welcomed so many other artists or so many other residents to the space, um, of a laundromat. And she has now continued these classes in her, um, her apartment in New York. And it's completely, I would think it was a very transformational experience for her um, as an artist and as a neighbor. Anyway, um, but yes, this is maybe one example of engaging uh, non-artists and really non-artists, it really could be just neighbors because we, we actually believe everybody has um, creative abilities and artists kind of privileges a certain kind of training that I'm not so interested in um, because everybody does not have access to that level of training, which doesn't make them any less of an artist. Anyway, um, uh, have, the applicant should have problem solving skills and be resourceful and be flexible. I really can't stress that enough. You, sometimes just things happen and you have to be able to kind of bounce back um, from anything that is presented to you in a laundromat space. Um, obviously the capacity for critical analysis um, of your work, of the themes that the work include, or that is the work is addressing, um, and ability to provide that sort of analysis to peers in your in the program. Um, obviously a deep respect for your neighbors and the ability to collaborate with a broad public. Um, and of course, uh, the ability to carry out a project at the scale that you've proposed in the application. If you're, um, proposal is saying that you want to go to the moon and you have never demonstrated the ability to travel to the moon, then like that would be an example of not, you know, demonstrating the ability to carry out a project at the scale. If you're saying like, I want to organize, I want to close down 40 streets and create this neighborhood festival, but you have not articulated in any part of the application or provided any work samples or provided any letters of recommendation or anything 
to say that you could actually do that, then again, that would be an example of not having demonstrated the ability to carry out a project of the scale that is proposed in the um, application. So um, let's go. Uh -oh. There we go. Um, so benefits of the uh, fellowship, a lot of the same things that we already talked about for the residency. Um, let me just bring them all down. Um, I think maybe the only difference is, and what I've already said is um, access to the commission's program funding. Um, that is not available to create change residents. It's only available to alumni. Um, so these are just some images from past workshops that we've offered. Um, so this is, I'll use this opportunity to just share um, what the workshops will be. And again, the dates for these workshops are in the guidelines PDF, which is on our website, which I will show everybody how to get to if you haven't already um, accessed them. Um, we open with an orientation. Um, it's a, this year it will be a day long orientation as opposed to a two day long, which it has been in the past. Uh, we will have a cultural organizing all day workshop. We will have another workshop that focuses on um, community partnerships and um, engaging the public policy sector. And then we will have another uh, day long workshop that addresses funding for your projects, uh, you know, work-life balance, kind of how do you sustain your practice from all these different sort of um, lenses, and then also a design workshop. So primarily we focus on like graphic design because we understand that all the artists that are in the program don't come from a graphic design background or are not all visual artists, but it's important to have collateral to promote your projects that is, you know, aesthetically strong and um, speaks to the constituents that you are looking to have come to the programs that you're organizing. So we have a workshop that focuses on that. We also, as a part of the um, program, have what we call doctor's hours. So this is where I think we had this image. Um, this was actually at LMCC, I think, last year. Um, but we invite um, people that are on our Arts and Community Council or other um, arts professionals and activists and um, uh, educators that are that we think would offer a good feedback to the current cohort. Um, we invite them for an evening um, where Create Change residents are able to sign up from basically 15 minute um, feedback sessions about anything that they want to present. And like doctor's hours kind of signifies like, here's a you know project that I'm working on. I'm kind of working through these ideas and I'd love to get your feedback. So as like a doctor providing that sort of- fellows too. Yes. Sorry. This is for everybody. Sorry. This is for all create change artists. Thank you, Yvette. Um, and so, and it's, and it's offered um, on a Wednesday evening from seven to nine, I believe, or six 30 to nine. Please use the guidelines PDF to guide all of your date and time. Uh, you know, the, all the, all of the dates and times that we've listed. Do not listen to me when I say seven to nine, six 30 to nine, I believe. Uh, in any event, so this is just another sort of, um, part of participating in the Create Change program. We have um, these potluck dinners that are an opportunity for artists to get to know each other in just a more familiar sort of unstructured uh, setting and just kind of get to know folks as people and not like in the workshop, you know, when we are kind of walking through an agenda. Um, this year we will organize a couple of sort of structured activities within this setting, but it still will be very light and fun and um, still give folks an opportunity to get to know each other and share um, share more about their artistic practice um, with their peers. Um, so these are some images from Allison's Field Day project that she um, did in collaboration with uh, four other Create Change Fellows and neighbors in Hunts Point slash London. Um, and these are some images from the Harlem Groups Field Day project. Um, so basically, you should apply to this program if you are already creating positive local impact with your artistic practice or you're interested in doing so. Um, if you want to develop your individual artistic practices by incorporating tools for social engagement. Um, if you can commit that time and attention to participating in the program's workshop. Um, uh, project planning meetings, potluck dinners, and field day. Um, this area, I cannot stress this enough, and Allison can share more um, about it when we go to her uh, sort of conversation about her experience, but the fellowship is a time commitment. Like it, it, one artist said from last year that you should consider this just a part, this should be like your studio practice. Like 
for the time that you are enrolled in the program. If you are in any other program, this is not the time for you to apply to this program. If you are um, in any sort of, you're taking a class that is taking up a lot of your time. If you have just a lot of projects, this is not the time to apply to this program. This program takes up a lot of time. And we really say at least 200 hours, but I'm sure that Allison could attest that it's probably a lot more than 200 hours. This is really like the base. Um, it's an amazingly, I think, fruitful experience for folks that have participated in the program, but it, it also, it, it comes with the cost of time, which is time well spent, but it is time that needs to be invested. And so again, please refer to the guidelines that are on the, um, on our website to get a sense of what this, what at least the LP time that we're asking from you, but then also understanding that you will have to meet with community partners to build out your projects that will be, that will take place on field day. Um, and I'm going to let Allison kind of talk about field day within her when she's answering uh, the questions that I have for her. Um, so also, I feel um, candidates should be open to building knowledge about the LP's anchor neighborhood. So, you know, your project will happen in Bedside, Harlem, or Hunts Point, if you're interested in this program and accepted to it. Um, and so you should be open to that. Like, if you're like, I just... I just spent time thinking about Queens. Like, I don't want to learn about anything else. Then again, maybe this is not the program for you. Um, and Queens is great. And I'm really sad that we're not there. But it's cool. Anyway. <laughs> um, and so uh, this program is ideal for folks that want to build community among other artists um, working to create impact within their creative practice. Um, and you should have a demonstrated creative practice, et cetera, um, interested in already making social engaged art, live close enough to New York City to attend all required program activities. So we have someone who lived in Pennsylvania and not in Philly, Pennsylvania, but like for much further Pennsylvania. Allentown. Allentown, Pennsylvania, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and so she, you know, she was interested and she was accepted to the program and she came to all of the activities that were um, scheduled and she just had to like, she spent a lot of time in New York, I think, based on the fact that you guys had to meet, right? And she had family in New York, so she had somewhere to stay when she needed to be here for multiple days, so. Yeah, that's something to consider, like accommodations. We don't provide any accommodations, unfortunately, um, for anybody who's interested in participating in this program that lives outside of the five boroughs or outside of the greater um, New York area, um, but, or metropolitan area, anyway, but um, that's something to consider. Um, you should also be at least 21 years of age and be able, again, to attend all the programs. I think we said that twice because we mean it. And so please spend time looking at the PDF on our website to see, um, you know, what our dates are and, and, and what is happening in your life to see if this is going to be a good time for you to apply to this program. Um, so be able to spend at least 50 hours attending fellowship workshops and then the um, spend at least 150 hours to um, do independent work, um, working with your group to develop your field day projects. So the selection criteria, again, artistic excellence is demonstrated in the work samples, familiar, familiarity or interest in local issues impacting their neighborhoods. Because even though you're not going to be necessarily spending time thinking about your neighborhoods, if you live outside of your um, three neighborhoods, you do want to understand what your investment in politics are around what's happening in your neighborhood. Um, your ability to actively engage non-artists in all aspects of your creative practice and capacity for critical thinking and analysis, deep respect, ability to commit to all program activities. So again, a lot of the similar uh, selection criteria for that we have for the residents. This is the timeline. Um, we will have an in-person info session on January 27th at our office building, or in our office building rather, um, and applications are due on February 9th at 11.59 p.m. I will show everybody how to get to um, the PDF and what the application looks like and where the link is if you have not already had a moment to look on um, our website. Um, and you should please mark March 19th and April 7th, depending on what opportunity you're interested in, in your calendars. Um, we will be interviewing folks um, in the afternoon, but if for whatever reason something changes, you should really just keep this day, block it out, and just have it available so that if your application advances to the shortlisted, um, excuse me, to the shortlisted um, part of the process, like that you're not like, oh, I didn't know I made a ticket to go out of town, you know, like, because if you're going, if you're going out of town, these are both in-person interviews, like then we can't interview. We don't do Skype interviews. We do in-person interviews. So please keep these dates um, in your calendars. 
and final notifications will be sent out on the 16th. And then we will then meet for orientation a few weeks, a couple of weeks after on May 2nd. So now we will turn it over. Actually, let's actually turn it over. Let's have a Q and A with Allison, and then we can quickly watch um, a residency video, just to kind of give you a sense of the flavor of la one of last year's um, residents. So Allison, Allison, let's bring up the picture. Hello, hello, um, <laughs> Allison. If you could start by telling us your sort of professional background and yeah. what attracted you to this program. Um. So I am like many people i know and probably many of you a person with a lot of splashes in my title um i'm i would say a movement-based artist moving into also more of a, a writing practice um and i'm also an arts administrator and a cultural organizer and an arts educator um and so what drew me to this was that i was coming um really for me the residency I mean, the fellowship excuse me um was coming at a time where I was deciding to commit a lot more time to my creative practice and move from, um, I had been working in a consulting and arts administrative background. Um, so, and now um, I continue to teach dance um, and I build arts education curriculums and I do some international arts administration programming and um, I write. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you tell us about your field day project? So I, and, and, and can you also, in your own words, describe what field day is? Yeah, great question. Um, so field day is a, I would say, the Laundromat Projects Festival um, to really celebrate all of the work they, the Laundromat Project does. Um, and there are so many different branches, and I think it's a time to really build connections among those. And also, in terms of what Patricia was saying about understanding community as places that are first have assets. To me, it's a way where you get to really understand so many of the assets that the laundromat project as a community has in these particular neighborhoods because I kind of felt like people were coming out of the woodwork. Like, I'm going to lead this bike and I'm going to do this. And you realize like, wow, um, the laundromat project is embedded and um, contains so many vital people. So that's the high level. What it looks like is neighborhoods filled with events. So as a fellow, we were responsible for a portion of the events in Hunts Point, but those were connected to the teaching artists were activated, teaching workshops. There were walks, um, community-based partners were coming in to the history, walks were about the history, the residents were activated. So it was a time when I think the Laundromat Project was really visible. Um, and some of the stuff that's happening all the time was happening. Um, you, could, you could connect it. How was that? Yeah. Okay. And and you were in the Hunts Point yeah. slash Longwood. So I was in the Hunts Point um, Longwood neighborhood. And so our field day product, which you're seeing um, a picture of, was in collaboration with the Kelly Street Garden. And so I was on a team with four other artists, Ro Garrido, Shea Adebango, Sasha Fires Burgess, and Priscilla Stadler. Um, and we worked with the Kelly Street Garden, which you are seeing um, that green space back there is their beautiful garden, which is on Kelly Street. And um, with Rosalba Ramirez, who is the garden caretaker, and then um, the residents of that block. Um, and we really um, got connected with them around June of the year. Um, and when we decided that, you know, we thought this would be a fruitful partnership. Um, so really, as a fellow, you're kind of given a charge. Um, you're given some tool, the tools around what cultural organizing is, um, and we talk about, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean to listen to a community? How do you map a community? Um, how do you bridge your artistic practice into working with the community? And then the charge is really use these and start to understand what's happening in your neighborhood. And so our neighborhood being Hunts Point um, and Longwood, um, and see how you can use art to amplify what's already happening. Um, so we met the Kelly Street Garden and it was their first year um, in existence in this iteration. The garden had actually, their, this community had had a garden in the 80s. Um, and so we started to learn about some of the things they were interested in, the history of this neighborhood, and ended up um, working with them over the summer. And kind of the first things we did was they were building tree guards. And so one of our visual artists helped them build sculptures to kind of discourage residents from sitting on them because they were breaking them and also kind of beautify um, and, and the blocks, I was working with kids, and these were really direct asks from the community. Um, they had a block party and they wanted some arts programming. So our first thing was just to say, okay, what do you need and how could we connect with you? Because we really um, 
were just building a relationship and really excited about the wellness work they were doing around building community around food, um, a, a really women-centered approach to um, to community development on like this kind of micro block level. And so as we did that, we started attending their weekly meetings, which would look a lot like what you're seeing, but be about five or six people, one of whom being, I'm in the back in the in the blue shirt, and next to me uh, Here. is Ms. <laughs> Carolyn, who's one of the garden committee members. So we started meeting with them every week, kind of in the back of our minds, we're like, you know, we have a date that we're gonna be putting on an event, and we would love to use this as a time to, um, to help the garden achieve its goals, which were really around kind of publicizing, making sure the community knew the resource, also celebrating the history of this community because it had had a garden, because it had a strong history of organizing. They had um, really worked for affordable housing in the 1980s. They had built, a, this community had come together to build a park. And so um, it wasn't really though until about August that we started, we at that point had been in that community, had been working, they were like, okay, so what do we want to do in September? What makes sense? And we started sitting in the same space and mapping out what eventually really became its own mini festival. Um, and by responding to their needs, we knew we wanted to pull in some outside um, organizations. And we were actually able to, in addition to the budget, the Laundromat Project gave us able to get funding from sponsors based on organizations that the community said they wanted to hear from. They wanted um, people to come who knew about job um, placement, about energy. So we had those people come and that was outside on the block, which you can't see. And then we had a day of what you're seeing right now is a um, storytelling circle. And that's how we ended our day. Before that, we had um, cooking classes. We had tours of the garden. Um, we had um, a sculpture making um, tree around um, what do you want to grow? So I should really back up. So our whole theme was what do you want to grow in your neighborhood? And so that's what we decided with the community. And this is our team of art artists, along with Ebony Golden, who's the cultural organizing consultant. Hello. Um, and so the theme, the, our event was called Grow Love. And this is Tanya Fields teaching a cooking class. And so we really just built a, an event that celebrated the assets of what this community already had and then talked about the things that they were excited about continuing to grow from actual vegetables to love and peace to more safe places for kids to play in. Um, and for us, it was really an opportunity to project that, to make the whole street and the garden that place for that day so that um, moving forward, they can continue to have that. So. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> so what was the, um, what was the best part of the fellowship? I think the best part of the fellowship is really the people, um, the artists who you get to know through the fellowship program and the relationships I've built in the, in the community with the Kelly street garden. I spent this morning with Rosalba, who's the, um, the garden caretaker. We had a writing date so we could get some work done. Um, and really those relationships, um, I think one of the things you talked about is being able to think critically and a willingness to learn. And I think you're going to learn so much in the fellowship. You learn a lot from the professional development sessions, but I really learned the most from just being really willing to listen to my peers and to my peer neighbors in the community. Um, and I got to work so closely with people who were so different from me. We would joke that our artist team had like five brains that worked completely differently, but we really worked to build a process where we could capitalize that as an asset. Um, and so those relationships have really continued to carry out and inform my practice and my ability to also name my gifts. What can I bring into a team? And also when do I turn to my team member and say, you know what, this isn't where I need to step up. It's where you need to step up or can you or um, and how can something be bigger than what I would have ever thought of or been able to uh, make on my own? Great. What was the most challenging part of the fellowship? <laughs> Probably this, uh, <laughs> related to that, <laughs> learning how to work um, with people who are different, both being those being artists and your kind of peer artists. And then also working community is one of the most fulfilling things. And it's challenging. You're not working on your timeline. You're not working on... It's not, you don't get to just say you have an idea and make it happen. You have to sit back and listen a lot. And like I said, we started working with the garden in June and we didn't, um, we didn't really sit down and schedule what field day would look like, which was in September until August. And so we really had to just sit, you have to sit with a lot of unknowns and be patient about it and know that if we're authentically building relationships, then 
the art is going to come into play. What needs to happen is going to happen. Um, and you, so I think just learning to be patient in that process. And so, I mean, I think you've touched on this already, but are there any other things that you learned as a result of the process? Yeah, I think I gained, a, in terms of the, the actual professional development sessions, I did gain, I think, a lot of more, I would say, hard skills around um, how I can approach this work from everything from funding to how do you build policy relationships. Um, and I think also for me, it was a chance to, uh, I feel like I can articulate, as I say this very inarticulately, um, <laughs> articulate what I, what I do more and what, and I have more examples of what that kind of work looks like. Um, so. And what continues to serve you? Again, I think you've addressed this in yeah. a lot of other uh, answers, but is there anything else that you feel um, should be said? Um, like what continues to serve you as a result of being a part of uh, the program? Yeah, I think it's, you know, so first and foremost, the relationships, and I just want to echo what Patricia was saying of the LP really being committed to supporting the artists who are part of this community, artists in general, but I really feel like that just because our, my official fellowship is over, I'm still very much a part of the LP community. So, um, and that those connections um, do definitely continue to serve me and inspire me and help me shape what, you know, next steps I want to take in my own career. Um, and I think that then again, those kind of hard skills of, um, of being able to think through a project from start to finish um, and I think if you just think about hard skills like applying for um, grants for this kind of work, having done it and having walked through each step, you, like um, Patricia was saying, being able to carry a project to scale, um, I think that that My name is Dennis Redmond Darking. I live in the South Bronx, uh, Hunts Point area, Longwood section of the Bronx. My Create Change project is called Good Trade, and what it is is changing and exchanging and also questioning the idea of what is valued in my community. So what I'm asking people to do is find something valuable that they feel within themselves or on themselves and trade with items that I've handmade. My project extends with creating avenues um, for people to um, look at 
uh, their community and as far as healthy living, um, healthy thinking, and incorporating ways to meet the needs of this community that the laundromat is in. And starting with just health-wise, so I started with the idea of juicing. Yeah, I actually live two blocks from here. Um, I've grown up in this area, so I'm pretty much aware of you know the things that are going on, the needs that are that are happening, things that are upcoming. So I kind of feel like my art can take an avenue within these changes that are happening within my community. I grew with kind of a, a hate and love with the laundromat. My mom would send me every. Sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna. You can hear more about Dennis's experiences um, if you go to the Vimeo uh, page. Our, our, I think you can get to it actually from our website, but you can also just go to the mail. Um, and I want to open the floor for questions. If you have any questions, um, please use your the question dialogue box to share them. Um, and while you are thinking of your questions, if you have any, I'm going to also walk us through how to get to um, the application on our website. The easiest way to do it is this is our homepage. Um, you just click this first slide. It's one of seven. Um, and it will take you to all of the information that you will need to um, figure out which application or which program is uh, best suited for you. So again, we will have another info session in person um, next week at 6.30. You can RSVP for it here. Um, this is the information about the fellowship. You should all um, click this button, uh, which takes you to the guidelines and FAQ. Um, this is a PDF. You can download it, um, read it, spend time with it, use your calendar to prepare like what's happening in your life over the next six months between May and October. These are all of the activity dates um, and times. Um, and again, we have not scheduled any time between um, August 18th and September 19th, but it's actually a really crucial time for all team members to be available to continue field day planning. As you heard Allison say, like a lot of um, a lot of ideas were crystal got crystallized and were put into motion in August. And so, because field days in September. Um, something also to note is that these dates, we are, we might, depending on who's in which group, these dates, these dates will be the same, but in terms of which neighborhoods are featured on which dates, these might change. Um, but yes, uh, these are just the dates that we are asking you to be present, but you should be also be prepared to be present um, to go to meetings with possible partners and um, for those that confirm partners that you will be working with towards your field day project. Um, this is a lovely quote, um, but and, and it just again reiterates the time commitment. And so they're also the FAQ is also in this document. So let's go back. Um, the application is here. You click here. Uh, and here it is. It's a purple application. Um, we color coded them this year. We ask for a video statement. And this hopefully will give applicants another way of answering questions. We also ask for those answers to those questions below. But you know, everybody Everybody has different comfort levels sharing um, information about themselves and their work. And so we hope that this feature will open up um, the, the ways that you're able to share information about you. If you don't feel like you can best articulate your process in the form of writing, that's not to say that you should spend less attention on um, providing uh, concise and clear responses to the questions that we ask, but it hopefully, again, offers sort of another way of... Um, answering the questions that we ask. So um, these are all the questions and we ask your references and your resume, um, you know, let's see, in your work samples uh, section, you will have these four options. Um, it's pretty straightforward, still images. You put the caption, which all of the sort of convention, naming conventions for these files is provided here. Um, please, take a moment to, to review that so that your file is not like titled xyzhjk.jpg and then, you know, we download it. We don't know whose it is, you know, just like help us help you to keep all of your um, assets of your application together by naming them in the way that we ask. Um, this is a sort of survey about your professional skills as they're related to our program, statistical information, which is completely optional to complete. Um, let's go back. So then here's the residency, similar format. Your guidelines are here. 
Uh, it also has the, sort of the dates. The dates will be a little different for the residents because they're not required to participate in um, the workshops. They are available. Um, we have them here. Actually, we're going to update this. They're not. Um, they're not required. I mean, again, I think you get the most out of the experience if you do attend, uh, but you don't have to. Um, Oh, wait, no, just joking. In the past, we have made it not not required, but this year we are making it required. So um, to make sure that we have, to make sure that there's cohesion between um, the fellows and the residents and like you don't meet the residents on one day and then never see them again until the field day. So, sorry, sorry. Again, use this PDF. Don't listen mm -hmm. to this. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, the FAQ uh, section is here. And then the application is also um, here. So it's orange. So in case you get confused, like residency is orange, uh, fellowship is purple because um, they look very similar. Again, so you'll you'll click these buttons. This is also on the fellowship um, application, but it, we want to know that you actually read the PDF because it has a lot of information that's going to be important to um, your participation in the program. Um, you understand all the program activities that you need to attend. And then the questions are all here. And then we ask uh, also for the same things by reference and work samples, um, the professional skills survey and the optional statistical information. So, um, yeah. Sorry, this is jumping back, but I just yeah. wanted to say because um, this is sort of about dates, uh -huh. but something I should have said besides, you know, learn and be open, which are important, um, is just what it might look like meeting with your team and creating this project is that, so this is just for people in the fellowship, sorry to backtrack a little bit, but I think it's important is that for our team, we actually all lived in five, four different boroughs in Pennsylvania. So we met weekly and ideally that was in person. Usually we would meet, um, in conjunction with our, our, residents uh sorry with our workshop and then we would meet in skype um and so we would meet weekly and then we would you know have tasks and we would assign different people to meet with different community partners um and then as we were maybe two months out from field day we were meeting weekly as a team and then we were meeting weekly with our community partners um and then i would say probably a month out we were doing all of that in addition to you know making runs to get supplies and materials for the arts and um, building work on our own and bringing it in. And um, so just so you have a sense of like what those 200 hours plus might look like, um, those are the kinds of things that your team will be doing. So you have, I think all the dates that you have listed, I think Patricia does, did, they did such a good job doing that, but your team will figure out the best method, but that's what our team felt like or what we did. So just so you have that sense of like, cool, you're building a project. What does that actually mean? How does a team of five artists do that if we don't live in the same place? I think it's all really um, super feasible and it's work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we have um, some time left and Allison will have to leave in a uh, few minutes. So if you have any specific questions for her, feel free to type them. I'm kind of assuming that nobody has any questions because... There aren't any new things. Um, there is actually no. There is one question that I can answer. Um, but again, if you if you you have them now is the time. If you have any additional questions, you now is the time to share them. Will will you receive an email with the slides from this webinar? That was the question. Um, so we will post this webinar on our website after next week's in person session. Um, if you have any questions for us in regard, you know, after we end this webinar, um, in regards to anything that we talked about or any sort of program details, you should feel free to shoot us an email at info at laundromatproject.org or give us a call, the number that's on the screen. Um, but again, this webinar will be available. We will post it through Vimeo, but it will also be on our website um, after next week's in-person info session. We encourage you to come and meet us in person if you if you would like. Um, the, it will be the same information. We will have actually a couple of other fellows um, who will be present to share their experiences. So um, while I think that they might be similar, you know, obviously they will just be, you know, different perspectives. Um, so that might be valuable to you if you're looking to get other insight into the fellowship program. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. So 
thank you so much for um, coming uh, or uh, logging on. Um, and we look forward to receiving your application. Bye. Bye. Good luck. Good luck.